integrals. Yes, today we're going to talk about integrals with the line integrals, surface integral, and volume integral. There are three different kinds of these integrations, and usually in mass physics, uh, we always discuss in these three different formats. In class, we already discussed a little bit, so I'm going to summarize uh, about these three different integrals. The textbooks sometimes they do not uh, reveal quite a lot of details. So in this case, I'm going to show you uh, quite a systematic presenting uh, the key idea. Let's get started. All these integrations, what, a, what a kind of integration you have, you always have an integral. So this is my first item, generic expression of integration. So suppose you have an integral like this, and you have a kernel or integrand, and you have some kind of elements involved. This is a usually d something, and here is a one kind of function like you have. They are depend on whether it's a, a, a line integral or, or just one dimensional or two dimensional or surface integral or volume integral, three dimensional. When we say line integrals and uh, surface integrals it really reflects this part. It's independent with whatever the function in front, front of it you have. If you have a surface integral, this part will become surface element. So that's a generic expression. And we also have the lower limit and upper limit like these. You could have a multiple of these. That's a generic expression. So the key here is that we're going to explain how these element is going to be written for line integrals, surface integral, and volume integrals. Because it's also involved spherical polar cylindrical coordinates. That's why things could become complicated. So let's get started. First, we're going to do the line integral. I showed you an example in the class. So here is a line integral in generic format. Line integral is one dimensional. In other words, the elements here, you're going to see just one D something. So in generic case, we write down D L. And this L could represent in a variety of ways to do that. Uh, typically, the path integral, it depends on which path you choose. And also, this element starts to change. Let me show you one example before I move on. Suppose this is my x-axis and this is my y-axis. I have a function look like this, and my lower limit is called A, my upper limit is called B. So I will do the integrations directly from point A to point B. But I want to do it along this particular line. So it's just, that's why sometimes a line integral also called path integral along this particular path. So uh, in order to do that, you must understand how the DL is be written. Show you one example. Suppose I have a function, let's call it f. Uh, it could depend on x, y, z, if this is the three-dimensional. Make sure when we talk about line integral, we only refer to fine element. Whether it depends on three different variables, it's independent, it's irrelevant. So then we have dl. For the Cartesian coordinate, and this DL consists of three parts. Essentially, it will be DX square plus DY square plus DZ square. Where this part comes out, let me show you in this particular diagram, but I write over here. What this means is the following. Here is your DX element. Here is your DY element. Now, if you choose the arbitrary path, so therefore, I have to choose arbitrary finite element, which is if you add them together, you get this guy. So this is, in the two-dimensional case, that's my DL. If you simply do not have these sort of path integrals directly along X or Y axis, I do not need to do write down DL. I just simply either, if integration is over DX, just write in the DX. 
If integration over dy, I just write in dy. If it's over dz, I just write in dz. So this expression essentially calculates the magnitude of this particular element. You know the vectors addition, these dx, dy perpendicular to each other, so hypotenuse is just dl. So then you will get this expression. So the key, as we discussed in class, was that when you try to solve for this problem, you want to find out what's the relationship between these elements, between dx, dy, and the dz, how they are related. If you don't know the relations between them, you cannot do the integral. So this is in a Cartesian coordinate format. Now, uh, this is the year, uh, essentially, once we find out the relation, we substitute this relation into that, and you can solve for this. So that's so-called line integral in a Cartesian coordinate. If you have a spherical ones, you also did do the same thing. So here what you do, you are going to have elements along the, uh, the R direction, because this is the spherical ones. Suppose this is your R. So we need to look for similar directions. Let's call it R hat, which means direction along the R direction. Now, a little change around this direction, let's call it dr. So therefore, the first element, you're going to see the dr squared. And now you could have some changes along the, um, uh, the phi direction. And the phi, or the theta direction, forgive me, theta direction, theta direction is a perpendicular away from the z-axis, away from the z-axis, and the perpendicular to uh, r. So in other words, it's just like this direction. So you're going to see the another element uh, added toward that. And we can find out how long this part that is. So remember, from here to there is my angle d theta. And I have a radius is r, so therefore the arc length, this part, is r d theta. So that's why I write down d r d theta squared. Again, because the d r is over this direction, d r theta is over this direction. So they are perpendicular to each other. So that's why that's why the hypotenuse when I add them together, it just becomes like this. When I add them together, and this is my hypotenuse. Now these are the two variables for the moment. And also, of course, I could have the phi change. Phi angle is defined over here. Phi angle, it's also perpendicular to r. In other words, here is the phi direction. In spherical coordinates, r perpendicular to theta direction. Theta had direction which is along this direction, also perpendicular to phi. These all three are, uh, are exactly the same. Now, when you project onto the xy plane, this side, this one no longer r. This side is actually r times sine theta. So that's why I can see r times sine theta. And how far, how large this lens that is. So essentially, you're going to have an angle. And this angle, this time, is called a d phi. So therefore, you will see r sine theta, which is this the radius on the xy plane times the angle d phi, and we square these entire things. So now we have a very nice spherical coordinate line element called a dl. Sometimes some problem maybe d theta is not changing, you delete this term, or d phi is not changing, delete this term, depending on which one you do. But this is the generic expression, so for the spherical coordinate. Now, the integral in itself, we also need to find a relationship between the r theta phi, because otherwise, three variables, you cannot do the integral. So you find the same thing, uh, like uh, the uh, Cartesian coordinate. And this is so-called line integral. Let's move on to the surface integral. Surface integral, in many ways, a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to show you. Uh, the following. So this is a surface integral. Surface integral, the element, the line element, in, in the beginning we have just dl, but now you have two, it's going to multiply by each other. Let me do one at a time. So this is surface integral. 
Suppose I have two surf uh, the surface integral, it has two limits. So limit number one, suppose a, a to b, and another b to c, uh, c to d, like these. So you must have two limits. And here you must have two elements, d something times d something, and uh, these two elements. And that's why I call it a surface, because suppose this is dx dy. So what you will have is the following. So here's a dx, here's a dy. If you model them together, you get an area. So that's how far the area there. That's called a surface area. That's what you do the in integration. And if you have a dy, dz, and the same thing. So you can have these changes. If you have a spherical ones, same thing. So it's so simple was that whatever I wrote down here, it can be used uh, over directly. Essentially, you're going to see uh, dx, dy, like these, come out. So let's do one at a time. So here is a Cartesian coordinate. In total, you have three different elements. You have dx, dy, or you could have dx, dz, or you can have dy, dz. So these are three possible cases. There's no other uh, possible case we'll show up. So that's the Cartesian co coordinates, and these are the so-called surface elements. Now here, uh, it's things much simpler because the uh, the integral itself is x, y, z, like these. And when you do that, you just direct do the integration. It's in some sense, as I said in class, it's much simpler than the line integral. Line integral, you see, you have to find a relation between dx, dy, dz, and then try to do the integration like these. Here, there's no need because if you choose Cartesian coordinates, and you're going to dx, dy, dy, whatever, which one of these. These are all ors, like these, all ors, like that. So that's the Cartesian coordinate. Now let's look at the uh, sphere coordinate. Sphere coordinates, also simpler. All we need to do is the element dx, r, d, theta, and this element, could be or you could be have uh, d r times r sine theta d phi. So in other words, these two times each other, it becomes another uh, the surface element. Or you could have a r d theta r sine theta d phi. These are all three possible cases. Now. These usually in physics we also care about the directions. So I can explain the directions. Uh, uh, the, uh, the here, let's look at the directions. For the uh, for the Cartesian coordinates, the direction. If you have a dx dy like this, so here's a dx dy, and this is in x y plane. So direction of the surface along the z-axis. You remember this is the x, this is the y-axis. And then uh, we use a right-hand rule from x to y. So you see thumb goes up, essentially the z-direction z along the perpendicular to that. For the Cartesian coordinate, relatively straightforward. Its complication comes from spherical coordinate. Here's a sphere. So a sketch sphere like this. Now. On the surface, uh, if I have a surface over here, this is my interest surface. So I draw a line from the center all the way to that direction. That's my R direction. So now if I, uh, if I change slightly along the theta direction, it's giving me the area. In other words, I have D, uh, DR now. So this is DR direction. And I change a little bit. You can, can you see the area comes out? If I move this direction, so this will be the area, like that. And the rest will stay the same. So this is so-called the, the area itself, and depending on which one you are interested in. In most of the integrals, you only have one element left. And if you have two elements left, it becomes a lot of complicated. But the, the idea stays the exact same. So this is so-called surface integrals. Let's do the last one, which is the volume integral. I think item four. Volume integral, uh, in many ways, is simpler because it only have one element. Cartesian coordinate only have d tau. Usually we use that. 
Textbooks sometimes use the V, same thing. So this will be dx, dy, dz. That's it. There's no other complication. There's no other variations because only three variables times each other. For the sphere coordinates, it stays the same thing. So this is sphere coordinate d tau. It will be dr and r d theta, r sine theta, d phi. That's it. So this is the integral itself, and then when you do the volume integral, what you will see, you will see the limits like these, from one to the other, from one to the other, and uh, the um, that's the limits comes out. So these are the generic way to compute the volume elements. What happens if you have a constrained integral? Constrained integral doesn't matter whether it's volume or surface. Essentially, the constraint one will be, suppose this is the volume integral. Essentially, what, what you need to know is that whether my x limit, let's go x1, whether it depends on the y or z. An upper limit also like these, whether these limits there. So you need, when it, after the integral, you need to plug in to plug these limits there. And then let, let me just give you one example. Suppose I have wanted to do integral, let's say x square x times y and a dx dy and dz like these suppose my x like this so this is my z-axis so this x axis suppose i want to do the integrals from zero all the way to one particular point but it's not direct it's follow this line this line let's go z equals x squared like this so now you can see my x is restricted uh, according to my z that will be so now in the beginning, uh, suppose this is a 0, this is the 1. So in other words, when I do the integrals, I have to make sure that my lower limit, upper limit, is all related. Okay. So uh, in some cases, I can consider that my z is my uh, integral first, or I can consider integral x first. But sometimes some integral, the order matters in the sense that which one you do, you do want integrations. First is easier, sometimes more difficult, uh, like these. Now, here's something you need to keep in mind. If I have an integral like the dx, dy, forgive me, I have d, dy, like this, inside of it. So I cannot change this dx or dz, use the previous ones, which means final relation between these two. No, I, in other words, I cannot do like dz equals 2x dx, and I plug this guy into it. Then what you will end up with is a dx squared. This won't work. So what you what you don't do, you, you should not do this. What you really need to do is that if you do the integral, let's look at the dx first. So dx integral dx, there's no other x term. So this will essentially give me x squared 2. Now when you plug in the limits, then you should be careful because the next part is the uh, dz. So when I plug in the limit, I have to start with a 0 because x equals 0, z equals 0, x equals 0. So this would be 0, this is fine. But the upper limit, not 1, not, that would be z like this. So in other words, upper limit should be the z like that. So you see from here all the way to z. I cannot do this immediately because if I do the, if I cannot put this equals 1, then you're not uh, constrained. In other words, if you put the 0 all the way to, uh, from, from 0 to the 1, this means not constrained. Constrained, which means I plug in the condition here. So this is the constraint. So this is the constraint. I plug in the constraint. So now, how large uh, the uh, this part that is, it determined by the z. So what I do, because this variable is x, so my x just equal plus minus square root z. So therefore, the, my upper limit becomes 0 plus, depending on which side of it, in this case, uh, negative sign doesn't appear because z all positive, so in the way we square root z like this. So if x squared over 2, and when you after the integral, you're going to do uh, z over 2. So in other words, you do the integration, so you have z over 2 comes out. And this is called constraint integral. You cannot arbitrarily choose I'm going to jump from 0 all the way to 1. No, it's constraint. You have to constrain in a way that uh, uh, some variables not allowed to cho choose. Again, for these integrals, if you have a volume, a surface integral, we do not substitute into that. No. If you do substitution, that's wrong. It's incorrect. 
you have to make sure that uh, the constraint is in the limits. Why the line integral, we will substitute that into that. Let me show you the line integral, what that looked like. So this is a line integral case, and then we are going to, uh, so you see the line integral, in the line interval, we substitute into these equations. You see final relation between these two. Same thing here, you must substitute that. But if you have surface intervals, we put a constraint in the limits, in these limits. So the limits will be have a constraint. Okay. And I hope uh, this explains things well, and I hope you enjoyed it.